I hope you're seeing my slides now. Okay, yeah, I can see slides, so go ahead. Great. Uh, so, hi, everyone. Uh, Nikos is the sort of version of my name. Um, a little bit about what we will see today. Uh, we're going to take a look at digital skimming attacks or e skimming attacks, as they're also uh, called. And uh, we're going to take a look at uh, a method of detection, like how to detect ongoing digital skimming attacks in order to, uh, to stop them. And this detection method is intended to uh, be used by application security specialists or IT security specialists or the, um, those programmers who are who have a, um, who are into uh, security. And we will take a look at the characteristics of uh, these attacks, and then uh, we'll look uh, take a closer look at how to how the detection method works. And uh, if we have time, we will also. Uh, get uh, a look at uh, a demo, uh, short demo. So let's get started. Uh, some extra things uh, maybe about uh, me. I have some background, as we said, in uh, development research. I work in telecom finance and I do application security since 2017, which means uh, threat modeling, web application security testing, education, and so on. And uh, we are, uh, myself and a uh, few other people leading uh, the local chapter in Stockholm, so you're very pleased, uh, welcome to contact us if you would like to present your own work, and we will be happy to uh, arrange that. But to the point of uh, this talk, uh, let's start by talking about skimming attacks, and we will start from the physical world, because that's where they initially uh, appeared. Uh, these kind of attacks usually happen at remote location where you have payment machines, ATM machines, gas stations, uh, places where they will uh, accept your credit card. And what the criminal uh, will do is that they will usually uh, have a, a digital device that they will place on top of the actual receiver of the credit card. And this is called like the skimmer. And what they will do is that they will target the magnetic stripe of uh, your credit card. They will copy the data and store it locally on the skimming device. That's like the, the standard type of uh, attack. Uh, of course, they go after your credit card information and they pick remote locations because at the later stage, the criminal will have to pass by, collect the digital equipment. That looks a lot like the, the actual thing, the actual receiver of the, of the credit card so that you will not be able to, to detect it as seen in the, in the image. And they will collect uh, the loot, the collected credit cards, and then uh, just sell them further on, probably to the dark web or other places. Uh, one characteristic of this attack is that functionality is not broken. You will still get your money, you will still make your payment, but you will not really realize you're being attacked unless uh, or until uh, your credit card information is actually used by another person at a later stage. Uh, let's make the jump at the digital world now. Uh, what are digital skimming attacks? Um, there is a term that is used broadly uh, when, whenever someone is talking about uh, digital skimming attacks, and that uh, umbrella term is uh, MatesGuard. So MatesGuard is a, is a term used for several groups uh, doing the same thing, and that is stealing credit card information from, from web uh, websites and from victims who are inserting their credit cards into these uh, websites in order to, to pay uh, whatever service uh, they, they, are, uh, they are buying. Um, they are quite notorious, and that's probably why they made it to Wired's Most Notorious People Online of 2018, together with some other really interesting uh, personalities. Uh, Europol has also uh, an assessment of 2020 where they have a whole section about them and there this group is actually uh, referred to as a group doing attacks using javascript and their goal is to inject uh, a schema code or a piece of javascript uh, onto payments uh, web pages and then still the credit card they use a drop server so that's like the server where they collect uh, the, the stolen credit cards and then they sell them on to uh, the dark web. So that, that's quite similar with uh, physical attacks, but in the digital world. 
a little bit more context um, that their targets are usually medium sized or small sized web shops. And that's probably because uh, these types of uh, web shops are not focusing uh, as much on security as bigger corporations do. And that's what the image on the right is, uh, is all about. It, it tries to show that there is a broad spectrum of, uh, of types of web shops that are being attacked with a special focus on miscellaneous and uh, specialized, which for me means smaller, medium-sized web shops. Uh, traditionally, the Magento platform has been a target of their attacks, and that's why the Magento platform has been used to create, can be used to create exactly this type of uh, web shops. Uh, small and medium sized and by finding a vulnerability there of course they are able to hack hundreds maybe thousands of uh, websites at the same time and then deploy their schema codes uh, but that's not that's not the whole story um, they have also some more popular targets which include macy's pretty service Ticketmaster, forbes and so on and characteristics of these attacks that uh, are that they are hard to identify uh, you have to be monitoring, you have to realize that something happens in your production. That's, that's not really straightforward as it, uh, as it sounds. It might be hard to notify victims uh, and to notify the companies being affected. The bank might reside in one country and the website might, might reside in another country. That makes it really hard for law enforcement to, to actually do its, uh, its job. And everything will probably end up in dark web where there are specialized uh, well, dark web websites that are uh, selling maybe even schema code itself, but also stolen credit cards. Uh, as a result of their attacks, there have been some headlines in, in the news. British Airways, they were initially fined with a huge uh, fine of, uh, I think it was around 183 million uh, British pounds or something uh, that was later reduced to 20 million, still quite a substantial uh, amount. And Ticketmaster also had to pay their own fine for their breaches by Maidscart. And these figures, of course, do not include settlements and damages that have to be paid to victims, uh, legal fees included. Uh, and of course, the damage and the reputation that you cannot really put a, a dollar value uh, on, right? Uh, let's start getting a bit, a little bit more technical. So, what happens in in practice? You have a payments form, and what happens is uh, the victim will go in, uh, fill in the credit card information, the name on the credit card, the CVC code, and so on. And on this page, you obviously are running JavaScript, the, the world wide web is running on JavaScript more or less. And this JavaScript, of course, translates to, to code, to source code that uh, instructs the, the browser on how to, 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 to react to inputs to the payment form and so on. That's like how, how it works. What these criminals will do now, and this is the critical point, is that they will find their way in, they will breach security somehow. We will check a few cases and they will inject their schema code. And that schema code is what will listen to whatever you're inputting in your payment uh, form and then send it to the drop server or, as we have already discussed. So that's like the bigger picture of how these attacks work. And they usually uh, choose to inject this schema code in existing scripts because that makes detection even harder. Now, let's take a look at the first case. That is the British Airways case, like them, the most famous case. And the characteristic of this attack is that this was an attack uh, targeting British Airways and only British Airways. It's, it's different from the Magento platform, where you, know, you find a vulnerability in the platform, and then this is exploitable in thousands of, uh, of websites. That's, that's another case. Here, they went directly for British Airways infrastructure because they found some kind of vulnerability and they breached British Airways. And that attack, the breach, the actual breach, happened about a week uh, before the actual skimming attack started, as we know so far. And we know that because 
a certificate was bought from uh, Komodo, uh, was uh, registered about a week before the actual skimming attack. Now, parenthesis open, um, the, the actual fact that they could acquire a, a certificate from, uh, from Komodo and register a baways.com domain uh, for their own use, that looks a lot like British Airways domains, but it is not, is maybe a topic uh, for a whole another uh, talk. But uh, yeah, uh, um, parenthesis closed. Uh, in this particular case, they went for a script called Modernizer because that probably felt maybe it was from payment forms or payments web pages of uh, British Airways. Uh, they were, by hacking the website, they were able also to hack the mobile application of British Airways because the mobile application was actually mirroring parts of the web page. So the schema code was also affecting the, the mobile application. And uh, as a result of, uh, of this attack, 380,000 victims were uh, lost credit card information to, to the attackers. And that happened because of 22 lines of code. And this is what the, these 22 lines of code looked like. This is the deobfuscated uh, form of, uh, um, of uh, the actual schema code. And we don't really have to be a Java ninja, a JavaScript ninja to, to understand what is going on here. Uh, this is like uh, an action that is uh, binded to the submit button on the payment form. Uh, so as, as a victim, you would go in, you will fill in your information. And by the time you release your click from the submit button or your, your touch from the from your touchpad uh, from the button. And this, what this functionality does is that it serializes the, the form where you have input your credit card information, your name, your CVC code, and so on. It will serialize all the information and just post it. It will do an HTTP post to this baways.com domain. That is the drop server that uh, the Matescart group used to collect all uh, stolen credit card information. Simple, straightforward, effective, um, characteristic piece of uh, these types of uh, attacks. Let's move on and look at yet another case from Ticketmaster. This case uh, I want to pick up because it looks, uh, it shares some characteristics with the previous uh, case. Of course, they went after the credit card information and they used the drop server and so on. But instead of going directly for Ticketmaster, like hacking directly in their uh, infrastructure, they went through a third party provider, in this case, Inventa, uh, which was a, a provider of uh, functionality uh, as a third party. So Ticketmaster was uh, injecting their scripts from their own domain into their Ticketmaster uh, websites. So what the hackers did is that they Brits Inventa injected their schema code in their scripts, so the actual schema code got reflected in Ticketmaster web pages. And in this particular case, they did not just inject their schema code in one script. They they had chosen several scripts to to inject their schema code, and probably because that's how they felt functionality for for them would work better. Uh, and yeah. As a result, uh, the schema code was working and credit cards were being stolen. Um, so let's make a quick uh, summary of what we discussed so far. These attacks happen through JavaScript. That's like the main path uh, to deliver the, the means to deliver the, the attack. Uh, they might go through a platform there, uh, that uh, the web shop is being built on, finding very um, exploitable uh, problems there and then affecting thousands of websites, or they might go directly for uh, infrastructure if that's a more like a, a bigger target, a bigger victim they are interested in and they find, they, they are quite opportunistic, right? So they, they find an opportunity, they will, they will take advantage of that, or they might even use third party providers or uh, advertisements or something that are being uh, reflected in your web page and by 
hacking them, they are able to hack uh, the actual victim they are going after. So uh, I would like to take a brief discussion on what is already out there about the detection, which is the main, the high point of this, of this talk. Uh, first of all, security basics. Uh, and security hygiene is very important. Patching, of course, uh, keeping the infrastructure at the latest version uh, is like the bottom line that every security team, every company should be doing that. If you're not doing that, then you're obviously doing something really wrong with uh, security. And the equivalent to patching infrastructures, of course, for the software uh, world, keeping your third party components open source components uh, third party components up to date because that makes sure you do not have any known vulnerabilities uh, at least uh, in your uh, running applications uh, another important aspect is that uh, it's really nice to assess the risk of uh, third party providers that means doing your due diligence for the code, uh, the functionality that you're actually integrating into your own platforms and your own websites. Uh, and then there are a, a bit more technical ways to and, uh, differences, and that is content security policy. Uh, if you're not aware with what content security policy is, uh, simply put, it is a way to instruct your web browser on which domains can run uh, scripts, can run images, can run CSS on your own web pages. So by doing that, you make the life harder. And then in case you need to run inline scripts, there are also ways to, to essentially assign an identity uh, in uh, on your inline script. Uh, that the browser can check if that changes, uh, the identity will not match and it will block your uh, inline script from running. There are two ways to do that. We will not talk details. You may Google that further on. That's non-source and half source on how to do that. Uh, and in the case of third-party providers or CDNs or loading scripts from another domain, there's also some precious integrity, uh, which includes an identity or an integrity code for the script you are uh, injecting from a third party provider. And if that code changes on the third party provider, the integrity will also change and uh, the script will be stopped from executing. Uh, we will talk what, uh, we'll talk a bit about what hashing is in uh, just a second. So there are tools, there are ways to at least make the life of the attacker uh, way harder. Uh, there might be ways that they can circumvent these defenses, but that would be uh, way more difficult to do compared to not having, uh, of course, especially con security policy and subject integrity that I'm talking about, because patching and uh, keeping third party components up to date is a must for, for everyone. Uh, but I, I, I would like to take a moment to talk a bit about detection. Uh, these methods that we have just talked about uh, is they are not present everywhere. And there is a good reason for that. Uh, they, there are means, there are ways to, to implement them, but it's not straightforward for all development teams. So my, there might be that your development teams, if you're working in a bigger corporation, uh, do not have the education needed to, to actually implement this. And they might not have the resources to do that. And if you're a, a developer working for a smaller company that maybe administers uh, several uh, smaller websites, then you might be also missing the education to do that, or you might not have time to do that. Uh, so th th the reasons can differ from company to company. Uh, so as talking about myself as well, as an application security or an IT security specialist, uh, I, I, I would really love to have a way to keep an eye on what is happening on uh, the production of uh, my company without uh, relying uh, on, on others. Uh, so I would like to have a way to, to do detection on uh, with my own tools and my, my own means. And that's what uh, 
this talk is about uh, presenting a method to detect digital skimming attacks uh, being separate, being detached from uh, well, from uh, developer teams uh, being able to do it on, on your own. And the means to do that, the way to do that, uh, is through one-way hash functions. Uh, and you don't need to know too much details or too much uh, crypto in order to understand what the cryptographic one hash functions are. Simply put, again, it's a cryptographic function on a pre image The pre image can actually be an actual image or it can be source code, it can be text or whatever. So that's called the pre image You apply the one-way hash function on that pre image and you get a hash value, you get a hash in the end. And this hash value will be unique for its pre image So you change the pre image the hash changes as well. That's the main functionality. And you go fast from the pre image to the hash, but it's not as easy to go backwards. So how do we apply that? Uh, back to the example where you are loading some JavaScript with source code, of course, on your web pages, uh, you get the source code and you apply a one-way function on that piece of code. In this case, I'm giving an example that's SAR 256, which is one of the available uh, cryptographic hash function that you can use. So you get the output, you get the hash value, right? At a later stage, let's suppose that an attacker is injecting code, but you're repeating this process. You're taking the source code again, and you are applying the graphic hash uh, function on that source code, and then you get the hash value. If you compare that new hash value to the old one, you will realize that it changed, and that's because the source code changed. So that is a way to detect that something happened in your production. That's a way to detect that the source code changed, and that's a security event that needs to be investigated further. So in order to automate this process, what I did is that I, uh, I created a, a GitHub project that I call Suricata.js from the lovely animal. You know, it's always on its toes and uh, alert. Uh, it's written in Python. It's uh, really simple. It's not a very advanced piece of uh, code. You can. Uh, you're very welcome to extend, overwrite, totally destroy, uh, or use it. Uh, it's, it's open source. Uh, and the functionality is as follows. It takes an input in a target.txt file where you provide the URLs that you're interested in monitoring in your production. And what it will do is that it will scan this whole web page, do it identify inline scripts, reference scripts, and so on. Uh, and if it doesn't exist in uh, its database, the script, it will hash it and put it in the database. If the script has been checked before and exists in the database with its hash value, it will recompute the hash value and compare to the one that exists in your database. And if they don't match, it will create an alert. So that's like the functionality of uh, Suricata JS. And at this point, I think I uh, have the, the time to show you a demo. Uh, so what I did is that I created a very simple uh, payments form on my local host, where you are supposed to go in and provide your credit information. And what this page does is that it simply runs uh, a JavaScript code that says, yeah, thank you for submitting your credit information. That's like uh, this piece of code seen here. That's very simple, just an alert. Uh, so what I will do now is that I will go back to my Visual Studio code and I will run Suricata. I have already done that as you see above, but just I, I, I added some verbose uh, output here that says, I found your script and the checksum that already exists in the database is this one and it maps the database. So nothing to worry about here, right? Now, suppose my website is getting breached and I will act as the attacker and I will simply add this piece of skimmer code. And what it does is that it takes 
the uh, web form that we see. And it just sends that to uh, a webhook site. So that's my, my drop server, right? So let's do that. Let's suppose I'm buying something. And yeah, that's how it looks like. It's uh, I'm getting the input I inserted and the CC number and expire. So that's like the how the, the schema code would uh, would look like and what the collection of uh, the credit card information on the drop server would look like. Now, what do we do as a defender? If I run Suricata again, it will detect a change. So it tells me that warning, uh, a new hash value has been detected, which doesn't match the records in our database. Please check that out. And that's more or less what Suricata uh, does. Uh, let's go back to the uh, presentation because I think I have one more slide to show. Yes. So as I said, you're very welcome to provide feedback, extend, uh, help me out further uh, developing this uh, tool. Uh, and one piece of advice on how to integrate that in your uh, existing monitoring platforms, if you're interested, is Alerts for yourself are not fun. <laughs> I've done it myself. I've seen, I've seen colleagues doing that. Um, this is a tool that creates some security warnings, right? Uh, that can inform you that something could be wrong in your production uh, in relation to mage card attacks. Uh, add that into the system where you're communicating with others. In my company, that is uh, Microsoft Teams. So what I did for my company is that I added a specific post function that posts in web teams when uh, an alert is created. And in this case, I'm showing it at the bottom of the page and uh, a false positive, uh, you will get that also. Uh, that informs me and the developers that we are together in this channel that something happened on, uh, on our production. Uh, and with that, I think I can say thank you to you all for being uh, here. And uh, if you have any questions, I will be happy to, to answer. <laughs>